Uh, for those who didn't attend the last one, hi, I'm Matt. Um, so before we get into the gory details, I'd like to explore our background situation and the journey which ended with us choosing HLSL 2020X. Uh, so um, we have a, our consultancy has a little bit of IP called Nabla. And uh, the target audience is an experienced graphics programmer who is tired of writing boilerplate code. Um, so we provide a vast collection of prefabricated functionality blocks with enough overrides to fit our existing code, even from other frameworks or engines. So um, one of the things that we kind of stress is that we expect to play second fiddle to existing code, even to ourselves. So there's no global state. You can start multiple instances of Nabla. You can have as many windows as you want. You can have no windows. Uh, and uh, you can, for example, uh, create objects with imported handles, native handles, like VK device, VK image, whatever. Um, and uh, obviously, to make some higher level blocks of reusable code, we need some low level abstractions, which will deal with things like file access, a consistent representation of the contents of an image, and so on. So, so this, for example, asset namespace is something that lets us refer to image without, with images without actually creating. Um, so um, only NBL video and NBL extensions are relevant to today's topic. Uh, now, our C++ API resembles Vulkan 1.1 and all of its extensions, uh, and other APIs were forced to emulate it. So all backends ingest SpearV as the only shader IR supported, and there's heavy use of SpearV cross. In OpenGL and ES, we had a context and worker thread per device queue and swap chain. So that means that uh, that would pr essentially protect us against uh, state pollution. Um, and uh, we also implemented descriptor lifetime tracking, uh, which means that we've had to implement and emulate our own descriptor sets, command and descriptor pools, uh, because we have reference counting. Um, so that's kind of a part of our optional functionality compared to some raw Vulkan wrapping libraries and render hardware interfaces. Um, the, uh, um, there are also, you know, some utilities like the buffer and image streaming, which we've covered in Erfan's talk. Um, and uh, there is a GPU entity component system, uh, GPU driven rendering, obviously the material compiler, which I blasted through. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some code to facilitate the conversion of NBL assets into GPU resources uh, while caching any duplicates and kind of resolving stuff and obviously all of the wonderful interrupt. Uh, so for the one person who stepped outside of the last uh, or two or three <laughs> of the last uh, presentation, this is a open source path tracer that we built with this. Um, so how is all this relevant to shading languages? So Nabla doesn't come with a single renderer or even a material shading implementation. You need to build your own. We give you the tools. And uh, you know you maybe you write some extra code yourself, but basically you know batteries included, but on the side. Uh, we, and we don't just prototype with Nabla. This isn't like a research framework. We ship with it as well. So our modules need to uh, be able to actually align needless dispatches, memory barriers, uh, kind of make sure that two different things are able to be put together in the same shader. Uh, override the data sources, syncs, uh, their formats as well. Um, and obviously, it's easier to achieve all of that while manipulating a high level language, not an IR, uh, in the video representation. Uh, uh, so, Nabla's unique selling point is the ease of reusing this code anywhere. So, this means as much as possible, we want to be using kind of same struct definitions between shaders and C. And uh, we even want to make the shader library integratable into third party engines without using Nabla at all. Uh, so Nabla isn't just a library of CPU code. So approximately 10% of the code base is just headers of shader structs and methods and so on, which you can just include into other shaders or even C++ sometimes, you know, as long as you know, kind of keep your to simple functions and you're agnostic to the shader stage. Um, so this is a case study. Uh, we have an extension which implements the fast Fourier transform. Um, obviously not the big, huge global one, but uh, something that fits you know, within a work group. So uh, there are kind of two examples that make use of this, or there's even like another extension called the convolution bloom. Uh, so both the test and of ocean simulation and the convolution bloom make use of this extension. 
And uh, they both actually kind of combine the work into a, a, as few dispatches as possible. Um, so how does this work? How, how does this look? Um, so this is the amount of code our developer had to write to perform the FFT um, for just the first out of the two dispatches necessary for the ocean height wide simulation in the compute trader. Um, the FFT bloom is very similar. So the only thing he's overriding is uh, the um, get parameters data, set data. Uh, and obviously, there's the animation of the uh, uh, frequency spectrum, which is kind of like a custom thing for this particular thing, uh, for this particular purpose. Um, so how exactly, you know, it kind of looks like uh, C++ symbols that are mangled for export, except you don't really have the whole kind of ZN, whatever that kind of is dependent on the type of your arguments in the function. Um, so how long can we live with like with this sort of name mangling and so on? Well, it turns out quite long. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of guidelines that we've made for ourselves because obviously there's you know 10,000 lines of code of shader li library. Um, and uh, obviously none of those things exist in GLSL, so we have to work around that, and see you know, the name mangling and so on. Um, and you know, the main thing to kind of take away from this is we're, we're not pushing for object-oriented programming in shaders. No, no virtual tables, runtime polymorphism, stuff like that. Uh, we don't want that, but we want other things. Um, and why not develop our own shading language, you know, because this is kind of the go-to solution that a lot of people like to do. Um, so language engineering is a very arduous, uh, expensive, and it takes a long time, especially when you kind of have some experience, you know what you're doing, and, and you kind of know that it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and uh, especially if you want the grammar to resemble C++ and have templates, because C++ is really complicated and difficult to implement. Um, and you're already kind of developing, you know, a whole framework, and then you kind of want to add the shading language development to that, and just kind of exploding your vertical integration. Um, and in my opinion, like every engine's or framework's attempt at a custom language is basically a toy or it's deficient in some way. Um, so, um, you know, shader stages are missing, resource type are missing, uh, some new feature drops in uh, Spear V or GLSL and it takes ages to arrive. Um, and also like visual scripting is all fun and games until you try and do something quite big by the visual script standards but small, obviously, by CPU programming standards. And then you find out that you know the uh, main bottleneck is the fact that the editor freezes when you kind of try and drag your visual script around. Um, so the other thing is like we say that Nabla is a cure to the not invented here syndrome, so you don't have to write your own uh, uh, RHI. And we should really follow our own advice. Um, so uh, now we're kind of getting into the meat of the thing. So. Uh, this is kind of like a very simple thing that we provide. It's a binary search. And obviously, this is the kind of thing that you want to use a generic or a template for. Um, and in the massively parallel world, there exist many ways to search. Uh, the modern GPU blog is a great read. In this particular case, we are searching for uh, unordered keys in a sorted array without subgroup, ops, and you know, work group, shared memory, all that stuff. Um, and uh, the main thing is um, you can see that using GLSL got progressively more painful. So uh, we're abusing macros for templates, name mangling on everything to avoid identifier conflicts with you know, other possible code. And despite all this, you know, we're still missing that NBL GLSL prefix for the, from the function that was kind of instantiated there. And uh, we're obviously dreading of the day that we have to override the uh, array access operator with some sort of a getter. Um, so now take it up to a, you know, another level. Uh, I'm just hoping that this loads pretty quickly. Yes, okay. So this sample draws 16 million entities with individual transform matrices. Everything is procedural, it comes from NSBO. Now each entity has one or more models attached to it. Each model has one or more levels of detail. Each level of detail is composed of drawables as forced by different geometries, pipelines, materials, and so on. And then each drawable is broken down into fixed patches of K triangles. And I guess we call them meshlets nowadays. Uh, so we call using the access aligned bounding box at each level of this hierarchy to reduce work for later stages. This means that there's compaction and work expansion going on. So for example, the red stuff that you can see there is, uh, by the way, it's, it's not lagging for me, it's lagging because of Google Meet. Um, so the uh, highest 
uh, level of detail of the sphere is two million triangles. The lowest blue is eight. Um, and despite all this, the instance count uh, stays below 58K and the draw triangle count stays below a few tens of millions. Um, so we, we use a statically pre-baked -pre reusable secondary command buffer, which is just a list of multi-draw indirects with you know, pipeline switches. Then collating all of this instance data for all of the drawables or meshlets that you can kind of, kind of retrieve the stuff of GL instance index during your multi-draw indirect. It's just a matter of doing a simple bucket sort. Um, and to properly distribute those workloads as you're expanding them, you know, you have one object which might spawn, I don't know, uh, 200, well, yeah, well, 1,000 meshlets, I guess. Uh, you need a prefix sum. And the reason you need a prefix sum is because you need to do a upper bound search in this prefix sum, and uh, that's how you're able to redistribute this work. Um, and about that need, um, I don't, I've realized later on that I don't actually need an indirect uh, single dispatch prefix sum. Uh, I could just use, a, I could just abuse a 64 bit uh, atomic to kind of append to a append buffer while also getting the prefix sum at the same time, but that's something I realized later on. But this is still very useful for um, an indirect GPU radix sort or anything else that requires an ordered scan. And uh, the performant GPU prefix sum is the Blalock scan, which uh, basically does uh, this up sweep down sweep. I'll show a, um, a diagram soon. Uh, and uh, we basically abstract all that, and it's uh, implemented as parts. It's basically a hierarchical um, application of um, a very simple uh, building block, which is an NRE reduction or an NRE scan. Uh, the thing that makes it special is that the count, the number of things you have to scan, the length of that array is not known up front, hence the indirect in the name. Um, so the way that we, and also like if you were trying to do this with um, subsequent dispatches, uh, you wouldn't know how many dispatches you need. So <clears throat> we implemented this in a single dispatch with uh, pers persistent work groups, and we made our own scheduler. And now, the um, the algorithm looks more or less like that. You start off with a big buffer, you do those reductions, and then you do scans propagating downwards. And uh, the cool thing about this is actually to scan a two gigabyte array of integers, all you need for that scheduler state, which uh, basically schedules your persistent work groups, is only a few kilobytes of data for the atomic counters. And this is just a small part of the code, which is completely unreadable. All of this is spread across 10 headers. This isn't even all the code. I have the whole thing linked in a GIST, 7,000 lines of code, after the preprocessor is done with it. Um, and I'll keep this in mind for a later slide when we see what a C++17 implementation could look like. And believe it or not, that was not the straw that broke the camel's back and made us rethink our choice of trading language. Um, However, while we were uh, we embarking on the Vulkan rewrite of our path tracer, I realized that a lot of code sitting around duplicate in small tests in the engine repository was not easy to refactor about static polymorphism. Now, not being able to do that, that was a problem. <coughs> so what did we need from a shading language? Um, this is when I started looking into possible replacement to, G to GLSL. Obviously, we wouldn't be able to compile fun oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> I messed up my speaker notes. Uh, so we wanted real templates of specialization or at worst generics and a preprocessor with VA arcs. Um, we wanted the ability to embed inline Spear V or transpile to GLSL so you could kind of plop some uh, GLSL code or Spear V so you kind of wouldn't need to exp expose all the new features in, in our trading language, whatever we ended up choosing. And obviously, uh, we wanted namespaces, structs, methods, uh, references or scoped pointers instead of the weird in-out thing from HLSL and GLSL. And we wanted to keep the non-C++ C++ syntax to a minimum to allow compiling entire shaders for the CPU. Um, obviously, we wouldn't be able to compile functions with inline Spear V or GLSL, but you know, the main thing. And we obviously need a rock-solid compiler because we 
notoriously feed GLSS Lang a shader C with uh, 58,000 lines of code and, and so on. So we also had some more exotic wishes. And mostly this is C20 template metaprogramming features. Uh, the, 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 the special stuff is um, uh, the kind of memory scoped and strongly typed pointer arithmetic. So we could, for example, pretend that we have a pointer and then just disallow to cast it to a different type of pointer. Um, a little bit like OpenCL and CUDA with the local shared global, but like with more restrictions on the global, especially if you don't have BDA. Um, and we wanted kind of linking, but not quite. So we could template stuff and then delay the instantiations until later. Um, so essentially, if we had C++11, we would be able to make things like traits. And if we had C++14 variable templates, we would be able to make that trace syntax a lot cleaner. Now, C++17 if context is great because you can uh, choose blocks of code at compile time rather than abusing lambdas or generic lambdas like you have to do with C++14. And C++20 makes all of this legible when you actually have to read the error uh, from your compiler about the fact that you put something into a template that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, um, so what we almost did, so this is kind of the thing that we kind of toyed around. Um, so the idea is to avoid writing an abstract syntax tree for you know, your shader by hand. And uh, Swift Shaders React does this. Uh, there's also another project called Shader Writer, which is by the author of Ashes, which is uh, uh, kind of like another implementation of Vulkan or OpenGL. Uh, so you build the AST from C++ by replacing the types and overriding their uh, operators. Uh, that requires certain replacements for keywords uh, to make sure that you don't get caught out by the code flow, uh, sorry, by the control flow. And uh, what you um, have is the thing that, what, what happens is that the resulting transpiled shader might lose some of the variable names or function names if you don't kind of have extra markup to annotate that. Um, but there is this thing called C++ Reflection TS, which you have access to if you compile your own LLVM from source and uh, apply a patch. Um, and that's actually not as crazy as it sounds because we've recently shipped an automated generator of uh, JavaScript bindings for C++ uh, to kind of automate and bind a little bit uh, as a single header library with it in a thousand lines of code to a client. So um, you, that would make it possible to transpile legibly to GLSL. Uh, and also to add a little bit of extra juice, which is to template everything on this execution mode, which I'm going to show, uh, to toggle between, well, do I want to evaluate this on the CPU or do I want to build the AST to later generate my shader from it? Um, so uh, that would be what it would have to look like because Pure reflection doesn't give you every, everything. Um, operator overloading alone is not enough to build an ASD because compound statements inside a function declaration are independent of each other. So you need to have like a thread local global that you kind of secretly append to. Um, and obviously all of the kind of macros to break out of control flow if need be. Uh, I have like a more detailed example, which I'll link to, which is actually how all of those macros would become weird lambdas to kind of restore control flow when your execution mode is uh, execution mode evaluation. Uh, and if we wanted the SANA syntax without resorting to this, we would have to actually write a proper plugin using libclang or libtooling. Um, so either way, we'd still have to maintain our own intermediate representation for the abstract syntax tree and maintain that, which is not exactly fun. Um, so is this too much to demand from a shading language? Well, Metal doesn't seem to mind. Um, and I was not really inclined to look into Metal as I cannot obtain the source code of the Metal SL compiler necessary for us to build it as a shared uh, library for you know, Windows, Android, Linux, and WebAssembly to kind of you know, compile shaders on demand because that's also what we do. Um, but there are certain bonuses to forking your language compiler from LLVM and your language from C17. Principally, that the code is now legible. And we can actually make out the principle of operation of the Blalock scan, at least within a word group. 
Um, now, for context, the fact that this compiles, and uh, this was brought to my attention after we settled on choosing a shading language, but I'll also leave a link to a shader pl playground where you can kind of see the metal IR, IR, IR that gets generated from that. Um, so, you can compare this with that. Um, now, to quote Master Yoda, there is another. Now, while DXC and DXIL being based of LLVM 3.7 and its IR respectively is not much in comparison to Metal, the fact that its successor will not only be based off the latest LLVM, but also probably integrated into Clang itself, captured our full attention. Um, so it turns out a lot of our needs and wishes are being met by HLSL 2020X. Uh, we have namespaces, inheritance, simple inheritance, that's what we want, static and dynamic methods, bit fields, templates using aliases, limited curiously recurring template pattern, static assert, scoped enums. Uh, there are proposals on the con uh, consideration for references and C99 designated initializers. There is a library target, but that does not work with SpearV output, more detail on the next uh, slide. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are certain things we would like to do with uh, C17 templates, which uh, we hope to kind of propose and maybe push through. Uh, and uh, we kind of really lack the C11 context, Spinai, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's a cool feature that we can implement SpearV from user space ourselves without messing around with the compiler because they support inline SpearV. Um, and one of kind of the examples is the uh, buffer device load thing. Uh, and DXC is production grade for DXIL, but it often generates buggy SpearV or outright crashes. We find that the test suite is a little bit lacking. The other thing to note is that the responsibility for and commitment to Spear V output is not clear. The number of Spear V issues in DXC is quite staggering, and the priority of fixing bugs affecting Spear V seems to be low. So we expect to be fixing a lot of things ourselves, but that's still better than writing and maintaining our own compiler. Um, so I'll revisit the binary search. We'll skip the implementation because it's almost identical to C03, except for the accessor concept. Uh, I'll link in the notes to the whole thing. Now this looks a lot cleaner and a lot more like regular C++. And as long as we can pass locally defined structures as template parameters, like in C++11, none of this needs to be in the global scope. Lambdas are transpilable to structs, so whenever we have access to them or not, it's just a matter of some syntactic sugar. It makes your life easier. It doesn't actually you know, give you any more tools. And this would be a single line of code if we had Lambdas template argument deduction and invoke result, std invoke result, or auto. However, there are some gotchas for a Vulkan developer. You normally want to be emitting Spear V for, with DXC instead of DXIL, unless you want to do the whole guesswork of VKD3D. Uh, the Spear V output has been developed and maintained by Google mostly for the needs of Stadia. Stadia. Um, the problem with the linking is that it's only implemented for the di DirectX intermediate language. Um, An external Spear V linking, you can do with uh, Spear V tools, but that seems to focus on OpenCL more. Uh, last time I checked, it couldn't quite handle like with the various shader stages. And you know, all of the conversations about getting the parts of DirectX IL into LLVM IR, and you know, last time I checked, they were all about that. And the emitting Spear V is, seems to be a, somewhat of an unassigned to do. Uh, with regards to the whole mainlining of HLSL into um, LLVM. There is a more distressing failure case, which is the implementation of buffer load. Uh, I link both the, op the, the whole thing as a shader play, uh, playground in the speaker notes. Um, so sometimes the structs just load garbage, and you need to load them member by member, but that's a different bug. Uh, and this thing is a little bit of a problem because um, what this does is it loads the entire struct and then extracts your member. Obviously, as long as you have a good compiler and there is like another layer of IR in the driver, then this can be optimized out, but not so much if you do a read modify write and you also say that the pointer is volatile. Um, so that's it. Uh, I think I have five minutes for questions.
Okay. <laughs>